So um, I'm here to talk about uh, OJS hosting in Kubernetes. Um, so first a little bit about me, uh, first a little bit, this is a lot. Um, there is quite a bit that goes into a uh, Kubernetes installation. Um, there's even more that goes into converting applications to be able to operate in Kubernetes. Um, so that said, uh, what we've done with it is probably not what most people are going to do. Um, I could see uh, large hosting arrangements potentially adopting all of what we do, but um, for most situations, um, going as far as uh, a simple orchestrator, which is what I'll get into, um, is probably the peak of what most people are going to be doing. So um, the key thing that I, I would say is that I'm going to be showing a lot, but you don't have to adopt it all. There's very small portions of this that can be adopted by uh, just developers and as well as entire uh, institutions that will greatly improve uh, situations for a lot of folks. So uh, start out with Andrew, who I am. And yeah. just before, I, um, mm -hmm. I think we're only getting about 80% of your screen. Um, I think we're seeing some of your background on the top and left and then about 80% of your screen slide. Is everybody else seeing that or is that just me? Yeah, that's actually intentional. Oh, sorry, sorry, completely sorry. Not yeah, a problem. <laughs> so um, the uh, first thing who I am, um, I'm Andrew Gearhart and uh, I work at the Pennsylvania State University Libraries. That's actually what's in the uh, background there behind the slides. And um, I work in a team of six systems developers. Um, it's, uh, it, it's kind of developed over the years. Originally, we were the folks that knew a little bit about the servers, but weren't really systems administrators. Uh, and we also knew how to code in a whole bunch of different languages. And so uh, we would kind of work with people to get things kind of stood up. And uh, that has eventually turned into uh, DevOps or systems developers. We have a si sibling team in our strategic technology department that has an additional six developers. They are responsible usually for um, certain particular languages and will work on subsections of all of the different projects that the overall library works on. We leverage open source software to develop and operate all of our university projects. So uh, that involves lots of different technologies, including Ruby on Rails, Drupal, uh, bespoke PHP, OJS, and uh, web components, just to name a few. Uh, also do things with uh, Django, Python. Um, pretty much if there's a technology out there, we are in some way, shape, or form touching it, using it. So. Um, we're now currently down to about 110 servers that we operate. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of the scale of our operation that we work with. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off Slack here real quick. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the scale of this operation that we are operating in. Uh, like I said, 110 servers now, that's actually down from at one point we had about 145. And that reduction is not because we're taking on fewer projects. It's actually because we are consolidating all of the different servers into our Kubernetes cluster. So uh, because of that consolidation, like for instance, we uh, uh, just in January shifted over a application that uh, it's a, called the Pennsylvania Newspaper Archive. Uh, it has about five terabytes of newspapers and goes back to the 1700s. And um, switch, switching that over from the uh, servers that it was running on independently into the Kubernetes cluster, uh, it's reduced our costs on that application from about $3,000 or $4,000 a year to about 50 bucks a year. So, um, and that's just in terms of the allocation of resources to the project. So uh, a dramatic difference in terms of being able to consolidate things into one place. Um, additionally, who I am, 
I'm I'm a proud husband, uh, father to three awesome boys, 16, 15, and 12. So they keep me very, very busy. Um, so that's me. Uh, in this talk, we have a couple different target targets. Uh, first, why Docker? Uh, second, we're going to talk about why Kubernetes as the orchestrator. And third, what we had to do to adjust things to make things work in both Docker and Kubernetes. Finally, are we done? And a little bit of demo and QA at the end. Okay. So first, why Docker? Um, it minimizes environment variances. That's key and fundamental to all of it is Docker minimizes the environment variances. So what am I talking about there? Versions as far as PHP, database, NPM, OP, OS packages, all of these things are things that when you set things up within your local environment, it varies, it changes, it makes it so that it may or may not actually work uh, depending upon what sort of uh, dependencies you have for the particular piece of software. It also isolates variances. So if I need to test PHP 8 at the same time that I'm also currently working on a bug that's in PHP 7, that's fine. I can totally do that. Uh, I just run separate Docker containers and everything continues to be happy and good without having to worry about, did I get that installation of PHP quite right on my local system? Or did I get that uh, the right version or the right configuration of uh, the new version of MySQL that's out or Maria or whatever the case is. It supports DevOps. Um, so Docker, because of that isolation, because of the repeat, repeatability of the environment, makes it very easy to begin to move into a full DevOps uh, methodology where you are um, repeating things, you're treating things as cattle instead of uh, pets. Um, I'm sure that folks have heard that before, but uh, just in case, the idea of keeping things as cattle instead of pets, when you have servers, you have things that are running in your infrastructure, and it's been just treated just so. Everything's just tweaked just right so that it all works. That's you treating things like pets. Because if you kick it over and try and rebuild it, how much effort is actually going to be involved? Is it scripted? Is it something that you can do in how, what, what sort of time frame would you be looking at? Um, so it, I mean, just out of curiosity, uh, and I'm going to turn this back to uh, the crowd here for a second. Um, who, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys set up OJS instances. About how long does it take you usually to set up an OJS instance? that's not using uh, Docker or something along those lines. Can somebody give me a, we can do it in, in chat or we can do uh, just mic yourself and give me an answer. I'll say I've got some development stuff scripted, so it isn't, doesn't take all that long, but the scripts that I'm using are bespoke and nobody else will <laughs> probably ever understand what I was thinking. So, uh, take some of the goals of what you're doing, but what you're doing is the standard way of doing it. Okay. So, I mean, if if you were to uh, onboard a, a developer, Alec, uh, about how long do you, would you expect somebody to take to set up an OJS instance to be able to do development on it? I'll be doing that later today. So first time I would say uh, probably an hour, maybe a couple hours to really walk them through it. But, um... I'll know later today. <laughs> All right. So um, with with Docker um, and pulling a Docker image and being able to use all the tools built within it, um, it generally takes about 10 minutes to run all of the tool set from, uh, from the very beginning and have a full development uh, tool set. If you're just looking to actually operate uh, the a OGS instance and you're willing to run off of a binary, we actually got that down to about 30 or 40 seconds um, to be able to get a uh, instance up and running with a uh, just a plain Jane vanilla, you know, nothing running inside of it, just a empty journal instance. So, uh, like I said, it supports continuous integration, uh, continuous deployment because of that. 
uh, also makes for quite honestly a good developer experience. And I'm scrolling. Um, it can be incorporated into most DevOps deployment schemes, including Puppet, Chef, Vagrant, Ansible, Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm. Um, the ones that we have actually used uh, at Penn State, we have used uh, Chef, Vagrant, and Kubernetes, and to a limited extent, Ansible. Um, Ansible, as we have things spread across a bunch of different servers, it, it makes for uh, good ways of being able to hit a lot of different things. Um, but as we're consolidating things into uh, Kubernetes, then uh, we're shifting primarily to all of our configuration being within the manifests for Kubernetes. Uh, Chef we were using previously. That's actually our uh, current main journals instance is uh, still running off of a server that's running uh, Chef and that deploys all of the different aspects of this uh, as we were moving everything over to Kubernetes. So um, again, Docker, great support in multiple environments, makes it so that things are nearly identical across all the different platforms. And so what is Docker? Uh, easy to use resource isolation in the Linux kernel. Very heavy words. Um, basically, it's using aspects of the Linux kernel to be able to uh, isolate networking, isolate process usage, isolate storage, um, and be able to bring all of those together so that an application is operating independently of the system, the host on which it's operating. It leverages three different stages, a Docker file, which describes a variation of a previous image. Uh, you always start from a image of some sort, an image uh, that you're actually creating from that Docker file. Uh, it's the true state of the code and all of the dependencies that uh, the code inside of the, uh, the Docker image relies upon. And then finally, you have the container. Uh, the container is the quote, running state of the code and its dependencies. So uh, you start out with some image, you uh, mutate it a bit with a Docker file. Once you have that Docker file uh, mutating things, that produces an image. Then that image is portable uh, across different systems. And then when you actually go to run it, you generate a container and that's the running state of the code and all the things that are hooked in together with it. So where should you use Docker? Everywhere. Um, from development on through production, uh, QA. Some people will say, well, wait, wait, wait. Didn't Docker change their licensing? There's panic involved because there's money. Um, it's actually fine for nonprofits in most situations. Um, there are situations where uh, it's not. Um, so definitely check the licensing. However, uh, in most situations, you're gonna be okay. So, um, so the next question, it, why Kubernetes? Um, Kubernetes is an absolute beast. Um, it provides orchestration. Uh, what is orchestration? Uh, orchestration is basically taking those three steps. Once you actually get from the point of having an image and turning it into a container. You're actually going to run things. Well, what happens when it's time to upgrade? What do you do then? Well, we're, we're used to the idea of downtime. With Kubernetes, what you can actually do is uh, change your ingress point so that it no longer is feeding traffic to your uh, application, make it so that it still exists and is running, but is running on an alternate port and then you can actually take that and do all of the work that you need to do in place with all of your backups having occurred in sidebar containers. Um, all of this can be scripted so that it just does its thing. Um, once it has its various different cues, for instance, uh, looking for text on a page, looking for response codes from pages, uh, those types of things, it can determine that it's actually ready 
So you can run your entire upgrade as a process. And when it's all the migration is done and the appropriate text is on the page and so on and so forth, it will go through and pull down the old instance, put, it, put up the new instance and everything is running in good. Provides flexibility and provides structure um, and it's completely configurable. Again, with isolated environments because principally what people are typically doing with Kubernetes is running it uh, with container containerization, um, often Docker containers. Um, and when we mention Docker, it's it's less that it's actually Docker and it's more um, the, uh, the the containerization specs from uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so CNCF. Kubernetes is a desired state system. So as I was mentioning, when you say I want it to be this way, then what it will do is it will look at the current state and keep that running until it can get the new state set up. So if you say I want to uh, upgrade the database, it will go through and change out the, uh, the image that's actually being used. And when everything looks good, it will pull down the old version. So in order to do that, what had to be adjusted? Uh, the key things are that it had to be adjusted to the 12 factor app methodology. So first thing that we had to do was uh, put all of our code base uh, tracked in, in version control. Okay, when we did that um, for the most part, we're, since we're lever leveraging open source software, the key part in each one of the projects that we've gone through has been an issue of um, how we're actually going to stage it within our own um, repositories so that we have the open source code but can quickly and easily incorporate that into uh, our setup. And I'll go through that in just a second how we did that. Um, we, you have to explicitly declare and isolate dependencies. Uh, so in our case, one of the key things with that was the config.inc.php um, for handling that. Um, and that's, that's one aspect of it. Another is being able to identify things like the, uh, the database server, uh, making it so that like we're, we're actually running a uh, MySQL clustered instance um, inside of our uh, Kubernetes for each one of our environments. And that made it so that we had all of the redundancy that we wanted, uh, while also making sure that there really was no way of bogging it down. Store configuration in the environment. And again, this kind of comes back to the config.inc. Um, we have a series of scripts where we can take environment variables with prefix, prefixes. And what it does is it drops the prefix off of that environment variable and finds a corresponding um, corresponding variable inside of the config.inc and replaces the value of that particular variable. So um, treat backing services as attached hosts. Uh, the key with this is that they're looking for uh, an atomic application. And uh, so you should be able to detach and reattach resources at will. Uh, the trouble with that is that, of course, OJS needs a database. So uh, there are a lot of different places where, uh, because it needs the database, you can only sort of do this. Um, so I'm counting this one as done-ish. Um, separating the build and run stage. Um, again, we have code plus the plugins. That's where it's kind of okay. Um, in the build process, we are getting all of the code together. And then when we actually do the deployment, that's where we grab all of the plugins. And the reason why we do that is because of the fact that um, you don't know what version of OJS you're running um, to get the plugins. And so there's, there's kind of a chicken before the egg thing that goes on. So um, right now it is what it is, but uh, with future changes and so on and so forth. And I think potentially maybe we can script something, but um, haven't gotten into that quite yet. 
So aim for stateless processes. This is just a, a miss. Uh, there's not really anything that we can do in terms of making uh, the system stateless, um, but we get as close as we can with a very large stateful application. So, um, and we do that through the separation of the code and uh, all of the actual state. Operate services with port, via port binding. So uh, the idea behind this is try to essentially move towards a microservices sort of mentality. Everything is operated on its own and I don't really care what the database is. I don't really care what this is. I just run the things and it knows what to do based upon where I'm telling it to get the stuff. Scale the process model for concurrency. Um, we have the ability to scale based upon database load, um, but, and we could theoretically run more web servers uh, in terms of scaling the process model. Um, but the only part that I'm not certain about is uh, how we would handle uh, sessions and whatnot. I think we'd be okay, but right now I'm still counting this as a miss because I haven't tested it. So, so the question of disposability, um, the state that we have throughout the system is all stored in NFS shares for the database as well as the, uh, the file shares. Um, so we're successful except for that state that we're maintaining. Um, dev prod parity. So if you're going to run an environment, it should be the same as production. Um, and this is 100% done. Um, everything is the same, whether it's in uh, off your local host or on um, in our dev cluster or in a preview branch, everything is the same. Uh, logs is event streams. So uh, no longer are you keeping logs. Instead, your logs are just events that happen and they are kept uh, running out to another service. So it's pretty easy to do in terms of uh, Docker. You basically have everything going to standard out and then standard out is handled in Docker. Um, and then from that system, you have the ability to sort of feed that to whatever. So in our particular case, we have a university Splunk instance and uh, all of our logs are being fed to Splunk. So, but that could also be done with, you know, uh, an Elk instance or gray log or any number of different services that you can stand up. Um, admin processes, uh, just being able to have that set up so that there's not as much that you have to think about how you're doing it. Instead, you just have processes that are just done. Um, and in our case, we have um, a set of backups that are running off of our state. Uh, so every, I believe it's, I believe it's every hour, uh, we actually have a new snapshot that's taken of all of our data. Um, so it, running back an hour, we have the ability to see all of the different pieces and parts and restore to anything. Um, our NFS is also snapshotted every four hours. So um, if anything goes wrong, we're good for quite some time. So is it done? Um, not really. Um, because of the work that was done in the community, uh, that gave us a, a great jump start. And uh, we were able to script a lot of things in uh, to make things work. So Mark and uh, Jay Tromino, I believe his name is, uh, did some great work. And so uh, that got us really far along. Um, our particular deployment, uh, we currently have one site currently in our Kubernetes cluster. And the only thing that has stopped us so far to getting all of our others is uh, we're having trouble separating out a, a multi-site instance. Um, we're running into a situation where uh, uh, two particular sites are extremely large and uh, the deletion of those sites from the multi-site cluster is uh, making it so that they won't delete. So um, 
our 12 journals that we have outside of the Kubernetes cluster are those, those ones that we're currently working on pulling it apart. Um, some of the needs that we have still to do in uh, Docker and therefore Kubernetes uh, is multi-stage multi builds. Uh, right now, it takes upwards to do a full rebuild of the entire Docker container with all of the developer tools included. Uh, you're running anywhere, depending upon the speed of your system and your internet, um, anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes, um, which is relatively slow uh, by most standards. So um, by pulling it into a multi-stage build, what we should be able to do is reuse things like uh, the portion that's building Composer, the portion that's building NPM, um, be able to take those different pieces and parts and uh, have each one of them built and only rebuild the parts that need to be changed. Um, and that should speed things significantly. Resulting in faster and smaller builds. So let's look closer. Anybody have any questions as we're uh, getting started here? No? Okay, so first thing I'm going to do, I lost a window. There we go. So forgive the little bit of sketchiness to this. Um, so this is the basic process that we run through. We have a, a base image um, that's, that has Apache and PHP. Uh, running on Alpine. And let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, and so what we do is, and of course that. There we go. All right. So the way that our basic process works is that we have a base image that we work from. Uh, it's a um, currently an Alpine based image that has both Apache and PHP in it. And uh, we use that as our base for building our base image. Uh, and our base image basically piles in a bunch of scripts uh, for how we're actually going to structure our container. Um, those scripts are then run by our continuous integration tool uh, to actually grab all of the code from the different places that it is, like the PKP repos and so on and so forth, injecting all of our system configuration that is standard, and then generating a base image. Um, that base image is a, is a Docker image, and then we store it into a uh, instance of Harbor uh, so Arbor is a image repository uh, that can be used by Docker. So once we have that base image, then that is then used for our individual sites. So each uh, site has its own repo and each one of those repos has uh, individual variances for those particular sites. So in separating out all of the different journals, that gives us the ability to have different plugins for the different journals. Uh, it gives us the ability to configure things differently in terms of uh, all of the different aspects of the system configuration. Um, once that's built, then we have our site image, and then that's actually used to deploy into Kubernetes. So that's where we have our third type of repo. We have a config repo. We have a tool called Argo CD that what it does is it looks to that configuration repo and hammers that, looks for any uh, hooks coming from it, web hooks, and determines any changes in the different branches. This is all branch driven, driven development and deployments. So anything that happens on the main branch, there's a main QA branch that occurs in our development cluster. Uh, there it, it deploys a, a web instance and a, a web pod and a database pod. And inside of those pods, 
a pod is generally one container, but it could be multiple containers, just depends. So in the example of web, it's just the one container. But in the case of database, it is uh, actually a collection of, I think there's about five different containers, five or six different containers in there. Uh, and that's because again, it's a clustered database. So we're running that automatically using an operator. Um, and that was literally us just taking that operator, installing it into the cluster, and then feeding it what we wanted it to do as far as the configuration for usernames and passwords and that type of thing. So that's our main branch. So anything that gets committed into our main branch, then uh, it feeds into that um, main namespace. We also have the ability in our development cluster to create what, what we refer to as preview branches. So a preview branch, we name it preview slash something. So in the case of looking at uh, a new version of OJS, we can create a preview branch. And um, what we're doing in our repos as far as getting the particular versions of OJS is tagging it for uh, the particular spot in the OJS repo. And then it'll pull from that particular spot. So that would then build that preview branch based upon uh, that information. As far as production, it's a little bit different. What we do is we tag the site, um, we create a tagged release, and by creating in a particular uh, naming scheme, you know, v number dot number dot number, then uh, it will actually identify that as a possible candidate for being in production. Um, and then once we, it generates a depend upon, I believe, either depend upon our circle CI, I forget which, um, looks and sees that that new release is there, creates a uh, PR automatically, and all we have to do is accept that PR and it goes into production. So like I said, we still have our state sitting over here on the side. Uh, university runs an Isilon storage cluster. And um, so we, we utilize that. And so we create a an instance of state for each one of the different environments that we run. And uh, that maintains the, the stateful information like the database and the files for public and private and whatnot. So, so that's it as a diagram. Um, we do have a couple of different uh, repos. Again, we have our base repo that has the information about um, you know, the, the base image now, all of this can be overridden in the various different uh, repos that we work from, uh, but this is the, the core uh, image base, essentially. We have the config repo, and that's where we actually define uh, which particular sites we're dealing with. So uh, in this case, we have uh, two different sites that we had set up. Uh, one that was originally called KPU, and then we renamed it to TD. So those are the actual two different sites. And then these are de different deployments of those sites. So to give you an idea of what that looks like in our cluster, I'm going to use Argo CD to kind of show you that. Um, So these are all the different applications that are running in the cluster at the time at this time. Uh, this is our uh, development cluster. And if I come down here, I can look for TD. So TDQA is is one of our journals instance TD dash gym test is uh, this other one that's here. So based upon the particular deployment being t called TD, and um, then the names of the particular items, then it, it builds out where it actually exists, which namespace it exists in. So TDQA is this particular one. And then there's a lot of things it throws out there for us. Um, but basically what all these are doing is uh, it's holding various different secrets. Uh, so like, for instance, this right here, the PVC, these are persistent volume claims. That's how we get our, uh, how we get our uh, ISLON, our network file shares mounted in. 
Uh, we have our ingress. Our ingress is actually responsible for uh, resolving all of the uh, domain names and where the what service those domain names and paths should actually route to. And then from there, we have the the various different services. So for example, this TDQA journals, uh, this routes to these different endpoint slices. And then those identify uh, the particular service that it's going to go to, and therefore the pods that it runs into. It can be a lot to look at all of the little boxes. So you can kind of pare it down a little bit. And this kind of shows the flow of things. So we have these different services that are running. Uh, we have the pod for the MySQL, uh, which again has multiple containers running inside of it. We have from our outside IP address uh, on the cluster to the ingress uh, into the actual service for TDQA journals, which then leads into the pod that's running, which has the container inside of it. And you can see there that it's identifying actually the images that are running inside that pod. Um, so. So. Questions. I know that was a lot, so. Um, so, um, do you also have like um, so a multi-domain systems, and how it is if that is uh, there? How would you will manage it in this kind of a environment? Yeah. So um, the way that we actually handle that is with the ingress. So in this particular case, um, we have the ability to use anything. Uh, we can put anything in it as far as our ingress into this uh, FQDN, and that would then route to the particular uh, service. So it handles that through the ingress. So like the typical way, like when I, when I actually did the upgrade and installation of this one, I had a maintenance page that was being displayed um, based upon a variable that was uh, set uh, which I think actually it's in here somewhere. Um, no, I pulled it out. Um, at any rate, there's a, a maintenance variable that you can set. And basically what it does is it redirects it so that uh, it was, you, you come in on the particular ingress, but then it would redirect you to a different pod altogether. So. Does that make sense, Dulip? Does that answer your question? Sure, thanks. Sure thing. I think there All are right. two, two questions. I like first, first and then Mark. Okay, yeah, thanks, Andrew. And, mm -hmm. and credit also to um, Mark and I know a number of other folks who are out there working on uh, Docker stuff uh, that, that also, um, it's a, an area of, of of the technology I've been putting off learning about. So I'm a complete uh, newcomer to all of this. And I'm wondering for folks like me who maybe are developers but haven't tackled containerization, um, what is kind of the first entry point you'd recommend uh, and the smallest kind of tool set you'd suggest for dipping a toe into this stuff? So the thing that I would definitely say is, um, I would say definitely look at uh, getting Docker for desktop installed. Um, that's going to handle things very well for uh, most systems out there. Um, and it's even if you end up having to pay for it based upon licensing, it's, I think it's along the lines of like a Netflix subscription or cheaper. So um, for something that can so dramatically improve your workflow, I think it's worth it. Um, that said, there are a lot of tools that are coming down the road uh, that will possibly be able to supplant that. Um, that aside, um, Docker for desktop and um, being able to operate in a bash terminal, um, bash or zish, either one, z shell. Um, so it, if you're on Windows, that means uh, Windows uh, WSL, uh, getting that running uh, would be great uh, on a Mac. You also have options there, um, but 
then once you do that, it kind of opens up a lot of options for you as far as lots of great tooling that you can use to just even get Docker containers running. Um, with Docker containers running, then you have the ability to start your database. You don't run it on your system anymore. You containerize it. And uh, the amount that that has changed our workflow for the better, um, just even that step alone uh, for literally every single project that we touch in our, in our library has been amazing. Um, because having a instance that you can just stand up and you go um, is golden. Um, within, I believe actually within, Mark, we have, uh, we have a Docker and Compose in there, right? Yeah. Um, And in, so, the read, and in the readme is explained how to start this Docker Compose. and But we can make a workshop if you're interested, Alec. It could take half an hour or so. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, And this this would get you started with uh, with OJS and practically no time at all. So um, that would be what I would do. Um, there's And there's a lot of different easy applications that you can get to get to run in Docker. Um, so, you know, just get something running and then see some of the different tools that you have in terms of being able to mount volumes and being able to get information in and out. That's where you move from, okay, it runs, so what, to, oh, and I can do this with it kind of situation. Mark, if you don't have questions, I think uh, I've seen Nate and uh, Michael. I've seen, did not see who was the first, but. Put me in the end of the line uh, because yeah. I have plenty of questions, <laughs> but I like to hear <laughs> Nate and Michael yeah. and Alec first. Michael, you were first. All right, thanks, Nate. Andrew, thank you so much for the presentation, for the time. Um, it looks lovely. Let me just say that off the top. It looks impressive and um, dare I say beautiful when you uh, when you had the control panel open there with the, with the top level overview. Um, for PKP's hosting services, we uh, we we've been managing a legacy environment uh, for many years, and we're currently just in the initial stages of modernizing and. Uh, and moving towards containers and increased automation and um, including more development into what have historically been, as I'm sure you know, very manual workflows, error prone workflows. And, um, and I think moving in the, you know, towards the direction or the state where you're probably already at. Um, you had mentioned the um, that you guys are using a MySQL cluster, and I was just curious to hear a little bit more about what you ended up going with and what that decision process looked like for you guys and how that's working for you um, as a first question. And then as a second question, uh, I'm just curious to hear where, in your opinion, the main pain points were or maybe still are for you um, with this deployment. Okay, so the the first thing uh, as far as the MySQL cluster, um, typically we had been running Maria in the past. Um, and so it was a little bit of a departure for us to switch to MySQL. Um, and overall, they are very, very compatible and similar to one another. The one area where we saw a difference uh, was in some of the code tables associated with um, MB4. Uh, UTF-8 MB4, and we do actually have a couple of journals that are using um, Greek and a couple of other languages that have some of the, the high byte um, characters. So it, it ha has actually been something that we've had to deal with. Um, but that said, um, it was feature compatible enough that we were able to get there. Um, the reason why we ended up switching to MySQL versus using MariaDB was because uh, Perconia, I believe it is, uh, had released a MySQL operator, uh, an open source MySQL operator for Kubernetes. 
And by installing that uh, into our cluster, we're able to pretty much uh, scale our databases as we see fit uh, with that clusterization. Um, so if a particular application needs more power, then we have the ability to um, scale up that database without much of an effort, um, literally changing files in a configuration file, uh, changing values in a config file, and it just gives us more slaves, master slaves, you know, primary, secondary, whatever the terminology is for the particular instance. So, um, you know, that's that was honestly the reason why we did that. Uh, the additional benefit was that it had the ability to do that, that snapshotting a very quick. Um, backup that uh, was automatically scheduled and it's dumping out to a uh, object-based storage. Uh, we're running a Minio instance um, and it's able to just dump those files off to there uh, by just saying what the pattern was and to turn it on. We had that. So, you know, we've gotten very far in, uh, I'd say about a year and a half since we really started all of this with all of our applications. Uh, and a lot of it has come down to making decisions like that, where we were able to go, oh, well, there's a tool over here. We can just turn that on and does it work? It does. Awesome. So that's really the, the biggest thing. Um, in terms of obstacles or problems with the deployments, um, the biggest issue was uh, probably in figuring out how to try and maintain flexibility of the images. Uh, while also nailing down all of the configuration bits. Um, so like right now, we're actually still, the image that we build up from the very beginning with all of the deployment tools and everything else is actually what we're deploying in production. Um, and it doesn't need all of those tools. Um, so it, it ended up at one point we had, uh, because of separating things out to, uh, try and find places where we needed to debug why something wasn't building or why something wasn't loading. Um, it was turning into the Docker file ended up producing an image that was like 1.2 or 1.4 gigs. And that was entirely too large. So uh, by re rejiggering the, the layers and kind of squishing that Docker file back down, we got it back down to, I think it's like 400 megs or 500 megs. So, okay. Thank you again. Certainly. Who's up next, Dilip? Uh Nate was next. Okay. Thanks. What's up, um, Nate? Yeah, Andrew. Um, I uh, thanks for that. That was really interesting. I think that you said there are about six on your team and maybe another six from another team in the uni. Um, I'm curious, how much experience with Docker and Kubernetes did your team have kind of when you started? I think you said a, a year and a half ago and kind of what was the, I guess what I'm wondering is like how, how long was the sort of learning process and sort of team skill building process that, that you had to undertake to sort of um, make this transition? So it, it was actually a really interesting transition. Um, while we had been, um, We've been running things in Kubernetes now for, like I said, about a year and a half, maybe almost two years. And um, journals hadn't been one of them. Uh, we had thrown journals in there uh, just as kind of a proof of concept at one point, um, but it was a, a very half-hearted attempt uh, just to kind of go, look, it does it. Um, we didn't use it and it kind of got thrown away. That said, uh, we did we did at that point containerize OJS, and that's actually what's running still on our other server is a uh, container-based uh, deployment that's stood up with Chef, and um, the transition associated with learning Docker, uh, learning containerized development, um, I would say, I don't know. It, having to do it without anybody guiding us uh, was probably the thing that uh, kind of slowed us down. Uh, but as we've gotten kind of patterns developed, it's going significantly faster. Uh, we're in the process of converting about 24 Drupal sites from uh, bespoke uh, deployments on servers into containerized Kubernetes deployments. 
and uh, the uh, the team that is working on that now, we've gotten pretty much everybody up to speed within about two months, uh, as far as them learning, them knowing nothing about Docker to knowing how to flop things around and rejigger re re configurations and build new sites out of the same patterns. So um, that's kind of been our timeline. Uh, the actual deployment we have, that one, uh, we originally started on it in November, uh, rebuilding it. Uh, we got so far and then uh, took the break over Christmas. And then in January, we uh, uh, kind of had another sprint with just two of us working together, um, probably all together about 30 hours worth of work. That's great, thanks. I'm gonna to have to hop off because I gotta to go to another meeting, but thanks a lot for this. It's been really interesting. Certainly. Thank you, Ned. So we have um, two minutes more. Um, uh, I mean, if somebody wants to stay a little bit long, I can also do, oh, and also if Andrew has time. Um, Mark has a question, I think. Alec, do you want to make your question first? Uh, I actually do have to hop off as well. So do, I'm going to transfer you host of this if you'd like okay. to continue, um, but I do have to jump to another meeting. Sure. Uh, but thanks, Andrew. I do have more questions. Maybe I'll follow up with you offline. Certainly. Uh, anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to uh, ping me on Slack and we can set up uh, Zoom if we want to. So. I have around 10 questions, but I will <laughs> pick just one. First one, one reflection. I think you are around five to ten years uh, uh, from what we will, what what we are now. Yeah, in our or in our hosting hosting systems, we are using. Uh, uh, we are still with cows and not with uh, with uh, what's the name in English? Uh, That's I, I versus don't... cattle. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but looking for this single question, I. I what will be your recommendations, your requirements to make OGS more easy to, to be containerized? What were the, the problems you found? For, in, for instance, uh, with the config ink, uh, ink point PHP, PHP uh, would be nice to move to environment variables to make it easier. Or for instance, uh, should we test it better with reverse proxy, knowing that uh, orchestration is strongly based on this? Two questions that rise to me, but please go on. So it, to answer the orchestration and the reverse proxy aspects, um, so far we haven't had any issues with that. The only issue that we've run into is um, just kind of the initial stumbles of like, oh, and we need to set that. And oh, we need to configure this other thing too. Um, so like as an example, um, our, one of our sites, uh, the site that we've stood up in Kubernetes, the um, one of the issues that I actually have to fix after this call is that, uh, or at least write the ticket for it, the max upload size uh, as it's going through the ingress, it's, it's currently set at two megs. Um, so we, we need to bump that up because obviously journal articles can be larger than two megs. So, um, you know, just little things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, relatively minor stumbles there. Um, the first question, Mark, though, would remind me again, I'm sorry. It's a just one question. What need to be changed in OGS to be more uh, yes. easy, easier to be containerized? Yeah, so I, I think that probably the two aspects that um, are kind of uh, stumbling blocks right now, um, and you can get past them, but just it's it's not ideal ways of handling it. Um, the first is that uh, the configuration file, um, the way it's currently written, you can't pull environment variables in it. And so you have to write the configuration file in order to be able to, um, you know, munge it to work in a particular environment. So uh, that's where the, the OJS variable script came in. Um, it works, it's a functional thing, um, but there are potentially weird things that can occur, um, you know, where you have the config.ing that didn't quite get updated 
and now your environment variable is different than your config.inc or it didn't populate a value or whatever. So um, in large part, I think that's handled for the time being, but I think that another way of handling that would be to go with a, you know, a JSON solution. Um, I think that that's probably one of the better ways of approaching it, mostly because of the fact that um, things like JQ make it really easy to go through and update and change values um, by specifically targeting, targeting a particular key and what that value should be or adding uh, different aspects to a particular key or an array. So that, that would be probably the biggest thing. Uh, the second aspect of problems in setting it up was just simply plugins. Um, plugins are a nightmare right now because you have the plugins that are standard with OJS shipping along with the version. Then you have the plugins that you have to add in and having the two different things to try and mash them up and have the correct versions of those for the correct version of OJS, it's, it's not ideal. So, and that's, that's the reason right now why we're, we're actually hammering everything. Every time that we, uh, we rebuild the site, then it pulls in all of the plugins brand new. May I make a fast one? If nobody else wants to ask. Yes, I think we can take one more. Maybe then I we have to wrap up also a little bit planning two minutes for the next meeting then. Okay. So did you notice any performance issues and where did you find the bottlenecks? No performance issues. Um, honestly, this is uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in performance uh, as it's been deployed. Uh, when we initially deployed it into uh, containers, we saw a boost. And when it was deployed into Kubernetes, we saw a dramatic boost. Um, one area that we were able to see that was uh, in our original OJS instance that was just bare metal. Um, we had a very, very large number of spam users that were still in our system. So if you tried to look at the user table, it would just die. Um, and so that was just a, a non-starter. Um, if you were looking at it without any filters, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so once we then containerized, uh, we were then looking at about a, a load time of like eight seconds uh, for it to load all of the users across all 12 journals, uh, including all the, uh, I think it was like uh, 300,000 spam users. Um, and now in Kubernetes, it, it loads in less than a second, so. We've also cleaned up users though, so. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So Andrew, thanks a lot so for this insightful presentation. I think all of us now also here, or everybody is responsible for hosting. I think I also have lots of questions. I think we will more become later in kind of a, uh, how to say, the documented way how we could grab your information as much as possible, not only this uh, or this presentation. Uh, so I think. Um, we have next uh, next time this uh, de demonstration from Alec. Um, I think we have to uh, uh, um, make a chair if uh, for this Lucene presentation. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if nobody's volunteering, I will do that because uh, for the Lucene, I was always, uh, uh, I mean, collecting now a lot of things. Uh, because I missed one a little bit also last time. Then if, if uh, you are okay, then I will volunteer for that, for the Lucene presentation also. Then, uh, yeah, if we, I mean, we have to, I think, uh, continue this discussion a little bit more, what you have done and how you could uh, give this um, presentation to the community, this, this knowledge a little bit, at least for some institutes who can, uh, uh, this, I mean, for me also, that was a, a, how to say, a decision which I had to take, but because earlier we did not have the native support for Docker, but it seems like now they, we have, they are having. 
and therefore yeah the, thanks a lot for this it's, yeah it's a lot <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah so, I mean, and, and like i said it, it i mean it is a lot but there's there's easy, easy ways to bite off bite off little pieces so exactly so take care all then we will meet on 5th may sounds great thank you for take it easy guys yeah. thanks take care bye